Good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I welcome you today as the church commemorates the feast day of Christ the King. I want to start with a question. What picture or even what emotion comes to your mind when you hear or read the word King? Advent Sunday, next Sunday, marks the beginning of our liturgical year. So as we draw the liturgical calendar to a close this Sunday, we are in effect celebrating everything that has gone ahead in our liturgical journey this year. From Advent 2019 through Christmas, the life and death of Christ, His resurrection and ascension, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the life of the church. And we are pausing this Sunday to say all of that is overseen by our Lord and King, Jesus. So together with the psalmist in Psalm 100, we willingly acclaim the King of heaven with the words, shout to the Lord all the earth, worship the Lord with gladness, come before him with joyful songs, know that the Lord is God. Well, I started with the question, what comes to mind when you hear the title King attached to a name? It's a metaphor which in our language is a term or title used to describe a pretty complicated concept, monarchy. Using a simple term from historical knowledge and experience, something that we can all identify with, perhaps? I did a quick Google search through some of the worst kings and queens in history, and there were more bad ones, I'll tell you, than there were good ones, it seems. Some were brutal and un unkind. Some were inept and useless, like Mary, Queen of Scots. Some were tyrants and pure evil, while others disappeared into the annals of history without even a mention. I then looked at some kings of our modern era, while they might have been called presidents or emperors or czars, and very few of them enthused me with a passion for rulers and leaders. I would love to be able to say present company in the world excluded, but I have to include that. And yet Jesus is celebrated as Christ the King. One has to then question if the word of God describes Jesus as King, then we obviously cannot use our experiences and our common metaphors for kings as a plumb line to interpret what it means by Jesus as King. Remember in the Gospels the couple of times that people wanted to make Jesus a King and he refused. Remember he went into hiding when he was on trial before Pilate and Pilate says are you the King of the Jews? Jesus refused to accept that title. You have said it not I. Jesus rejected the whole idea of being a King and calls us also to reject this idea. So what's wrong with calling Jesus the King, as we understand that title anyway? Well, there are actually three pointers in the Gospels themselves and in what we know from a long litany of kings and rulers and emperors that paints a picture in our minds of the very antithesis of who Jesus was as he walked this earth. Let me explain. Kings, you see, have power. Kings have wealth. Kings lord it over others. Kings use force and killing to get their way. Not so with Jesus. Look at the idea of having power over others. There's that incident in the gospel where James and John come to Jesus seeking the first place in his kingdom. They're thinking of a human kingdom. They want to be at his right hand and at his left hand. And Jesus is understandably upset knowing Christ as we do. And he not only rebukes them, but he calls all the disciples together and says to all of them, look among the Gentiles, he says, those who are not part of God's chosen people, those that in power lord it over others, lord it over others, among you, it cannot be that way. The one, the one who is to lead must be the servant of all, the slave of all, in fact, is what Jesus says. Isn't that what our Lord showed us dramatically at the Last Supper when he got down in front of each disciple and washed their feet? 
He took the role of a slave, of a servant. He said, as I have done to you, you must do to others. You must be servants. That's not the way kings and human kingdoms act. Any of you who have been watching The Crown on Netflix will know that royalty simply doesn't act like that. Or take wealth. Kings are identified with wealth. They have everything they need. They draw money from the poor and build up their own wealth so that they can always do whatever they want that money can obtain. There's that incident in the Gospels where that young man comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to gain everlasting life? He was a wealthy young man. And Jesus says, well, keep the commandment. And he replies, I've done that from my youth, my early years. And Jesus looks at him. The gospel says it all with love and says, if you want to truly be perfect, to follow me, go and sell everything you have. Give it to the poor. Then come and follow me. Don't depend on your riches any longer, your wealth. Follow me. Live a life of simplicity, is what Christ was saying. A life of poverty, indeed. Having what you need, but not more than what you need. In that gospel incident, the young man went away sad because he had great possessions. He wasn't willing to let go, to not keep on trying to build up, accumulate wealth, get more and more and more, as is the world's way. And the third kind of idea I gave us of a king was kings use force. That's our understanding through, through, through millennia. They go to war to get their ways. Jesus utterly rejected violence. Look even at the garden, at the risk of his own life. They're coming to take him prisoner, to torture him, to put him to death. One of his disciples say, I must defend him, I must prevent this. And so Peter draws his sword and begins to flail with the sword, slicing off the ear of the high priest's servant. Jesus says, put away your sword. Don't use violence. Those who live by the sword, said Christ, die by the sword. Violence begets violence, always greater violence. And so instead of the violence, Jesus heals the person whose ear had been severed. He reaches out in love, the ultimate the ultimate weapon of war, love. These are the ways of Christ, and they are dramatically difficult. It reminds me of what the prophet Isaiah says when he says about God, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, my ways are above your ways, says the prophet. My thoughts above your thoughts. We can't just follow the ways of the world, the ways of our flawed humanness, and want to dominate over others, that want to accumulate in wealth, that want to use force. For Jesus says, my ways are not your ways. As your king and as your Lord, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And he says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 36, my kingdom indeed is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now, my kingdom is from another place. Human kings follow the ways of the world and Jesus never did. He came to draw in a new kingdom. So it's really an anomaly, a contradiction to think of Jesus as king in our minds because right away we think of the wrong aspects of the earthly kings, power, wealth and force, as I've just um, gone through. In what way does Jesus represent kingship? During my time in school ministry in Grahamstown, I often used DVDs to teach the younger children the more difficult things of the faith. And there are hosts of incredible productions that tell the gospel story and that can hold the young mind far better than I can. And as I was beginning to prepare today's sermon, my mind went directly to one such movie, the dramatization of C.S. Lewis's The Lion, The Witch and The Wardrobe. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to travel to a brand new world in an instant? The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, a children's fantasy novel from 1950 about Peter and Susan and Edmund and Lucy get to do just that. And throughout their adventures in Narnia, Lewis uses several main themes to give the readers lots to think about. 
Lewis discusses the themes of good versus evil, betrayal and forgiveness, courage, transformation, the natural world, and magic in the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Aslan is presented as the Lion King. C.S. Lewis never said straight out that Aslan represented Jesus, but he did respond to a young re reader with the answer, 11-year-old girl named Hilla wrote to Lewis and asked what's, what Aslan's, Aslan's other name in our world was. And Lewis's response was, as to Aslan's other name, well, I want you to guess. Has there never been anyone in the world who, one, arrived at the same time as Father Christmas? Two, said he was the son of the great emperor? Three, gave himself up for someone else's fault to be jeered at and killed by wicked people? Four, came to life again? Five, is sometimes spoken of as a lamb? Don't you really know his name in this world? Think it over and let me know the answer. If you get stuck on that one, please do come back to me and I can, I can lead you towards that answer. This morning then, as we are called to celebrate the Feast of Christ the King, I think we must acknowledge that in so many ways this idea of Jesus being King goes against the genuine way of Jesus because he rejected power over others. Above all, our Lord rejected the things of violence. He chose the way of suffering and death, showing forth love for those who were doing this to him. He was willing to suffer rather than inflict suffering, willing to be killed rather than to kill, because he knew the way of active love was the only way to transform our world into the reign of God. Our scriptures today help us enormously to understand Jesus as King. In Ezekiel, we have that incredibly powerful image of the servant King, the Good Shepherd, caring and sacrificial in love and a total commitment to his people. The idea portrayed in Ezekiel is of a King who would come in order to, as he says in verse 11, for this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. In verse 12 he said, I will rescue them from all the places where they have scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. In verse 13 he says, I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the, ra in the ravines and in all the settlements in the land. In verse 14 he says, I will tend them in good pasture. He's just again and again speaking about the, the good, the, the, the shepherd after God's own, help, own heart, tending the sheep having them lie down, binding up the injured, strengthening the weak in verse 16, I will shepherd the flock with justice. That is the King of, his, of, 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 that is the King of heaven. Our gospel today also gives us a picture of the righteous judge. Jesus clearly the antithesis of the metaphorical picture that one immediately calls to mind when thinking about earthly kings as our example. Jesus the epitome of the perfect picture, the metaphor, the avatar that the scriptures portray in various places. The same Jesus whom we crucified has become our king and perfect carer, judge, and nothing at all like any king who has ever gone before or who will follow in this world. Jesus is indeed above all else in our worship and honor, in glory and majesty, in holiness and righteousness and love, our King, King Jesus. And so we need to portray Christ as the primary metaphor to any prospective king or ruler that we appoint, that we vote for, that we build up in this world. They need to follow the way of Christ the King, not Christ follow the way of the earthly King, for our Christ is our Saviour. And so Jesus turns to his disciples at one stage and as it were, has a little gallop poll by asking the disciples the question, who do you say I am? And there were all kinds of answers that came out of those disciples, a prophet, an angel, Elijah, or anything else but our Lord and King. And in the second round of that poll, when Jesus asked Peter to give him his personal opinion, Peter ultimately comes out with a powerful acknowledgement, you are the Messiah the Son of the living God. Peter is saying there is no one mightier, 
no one more majestic than you are. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it is therefore written in the book of Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 5, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of this earth, be it that all kings of this earth would come under the lordship of Christ. Revelation chapter 17 verse 14 leaves us in no doubt as it is simply written again, he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. In closing, I love pageantry and I must confess that I'm a bit of a royalist at heart. I can sit and watch YouTube clips of the changing of the guard and the parades of Buckingham Palace for ages. Whenever I get the chance to get to London, there's two standard stops that I always make for Buckingham Palace, obviously, and the Guards Chapel, whom many of you I'm sure will have visited. I'm a huge admirer of the Queen of England. I'm a little worried about who the next king will be, simply because they are all earthly kings and queens from the time of the great King David to even the dear faithful Queen Elizabeth, in spite of Netflix's negative portrayal of her in The Crown. But there have been a plethora of others with oodles of intrigue and mischief and corruption. When we acclaim Jesus as the King of Kings, we are acknowledging that Christ is unlike any other. Our King Jesus is indeed the ruler of all creation and by definition all must include you and me and all who acknowledge Jesus as Lord and King, Saviour, Redeemer and Friend. After all, the word is absolutely clear that all of us, every single one of us, eventually will kneel down before the King. For Paul says in Philippians, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I want you to understand that you will acknowledge Christ as King, either in this life or in the judgment to come. Amen.